Manufacturing can be a complicated and overwhelming process, and a big part of that process is taking risks. But nobody said that you had to do it alone. I'm Jonathan Azparty, President and CEO of Laval, and I'd like you to have a look at the people and the practices that have helped make Laval a leading compression mold builder and composite part solution provider in North America. Let's go have a look. Founded by my father in 1975, Laval remains privately owned and has a full service composite part supplier. Our team of highly skilled professionals will walk with you step by step through the manufacturing journey from concept to completion. This has been something instilled in us from the beginning. One of the many things that sets us apart are the connections we make with our clients. Laval's commitment to getting the most accurate part for our clients and reinvesting in part production technology gives you a competitive edge. Our innovations division is committed to the prototyping process, offering turnkey solutions from tool sampling, equipment commissioning, and full-scale production if needed. Having open communication with our clients and our suppliers is paramount. As a company, we're dedicated to the production processes with aggressive pricing, the best quality results, and in the shortest period of time. This is how we guarantee production-ready molds and parts. Manufacturing is complicated, so you need a partner you can trust. That's Laval. Find out more about us by visiting lavaltool.net or give us a call today. We look forward to working with you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Invest One's Resix Emerging Tech and Automation. We we'll have an opportunity here with Sabre and Brian to spend a little bit of time going over how automation will shape the post-pandemic world, specifically in the agricultural setting. So without further ado, we'll get rolling. I'd like to introduce myself as the moderator today. My name is Aaron Corsi, and I'm the Manager of Science, Government and Regulatory Affairs with the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers. But more importantly, I'd like to introduce our first guest. He's a tomato grower and a very bright gentleman who has developed Ecoation along with his wife. And he has uh, put together some very good information for us as it relates to Ecoation and some of their integrated pest management. So if I could turn it over to Sabre, good morning and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Aaron, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm Sabri Mir Smiley, founder and uh, CEO of Equation. I assume you all can see my presentation right now. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, how the future of horticulture is collaborative, where we are going to combine uh, human knowledge uh, with machine precision. Um, I'm in Belgium right now uh, in Europe, uh, basically taking our Canadian technology to the global stage. But uh, this is not the first time uh, we've been doing this. Uh, the company Equation has been around uh, for more than a decade. In fact, 12 years. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I started Equation with my wife, Miriam, in her kitchen table uh, after I came back from New York, uh, from Wall Street, and decided that, uh, you know, that world is not for me. And as a former greenhouse grower, I want to go back to where I belong. The headquarter of the company is in North Vancouver. We uh, started the second office in Kingsville, Ontario next year, last year. And now we have teams in Brazil and India, uh, roughly around 100 people. Uh, over the years, we of course received a lot of recognitions. Uh, some of the cool ones was the Olympic of Innovation, where I shared the stage with the likes of Elon Musk and Anusha Ansari. And recently, we've been selected as part of the top 10 uh, companies in the world who are going to uh, grow food in international space station. Uh, as someone who grow uh, hot peppers uh, for fun, uh, I like to actually have a zero G hot sauce. Uh, before I jump into uh, the explanation of the product and what I do, I want to uh, let you know that um, as a biologist and as a grower, I spend uh, a lot of my uh, you know adult life uh, studying bugs and plants and how they interact with each other or in another world, how to use, uh, lose all of your hair in, uh, in 15 years. Uh, there are lots of interesting, intricate, complex problems that exist in agriculture that can be addressed by automation. But this is probably the last bastion of big industry that has not fully adopted uh, automation to its greatest intent. And this is why we need to really pay attention because if anything we learn from pandemic, uh, when things go sideways, we all still need to eat. Uh, when, when it happened, uh, a lot of my colleagues actually asked, okay, are we going to be safe? Are we going to lose our job? 
And I asked them, what did you do first when you heard about the lockdown? Everybody rushed to the supermarkets and grabbed pasta sauce and toilet paper. Uh, so as long as people have to eat and think about the aftermath, we are going to be fine. But having said that, it's very important to go into the industry from the perspective of a farmer, not necessarily just an engineer. So I was lucky to have that perspective myself and along with my wife, uh, who's an engineering physicist, built the company uh, that actually, uh, you know, landed here. And of course, uh, you know, over the years, you had uh, multiple patents and uh, things of that technology um, uh, that uh, you'll see in a second. So what do we offer is a combination of uh, human knowledge and technical advice with what you can actually get from the machine in terms of the AI and the machine vision and, uh, you know, um, all the good things in between. My philosophy is that the future uh, requires people to use uh, still their high cognitive, uh, you know, influence to make uh, this technology work. And I, and I know there are lots of conversations about replacing the grower or robots that can grow the food for us. Uh, I really don't believe in that. I believe that uh, human will have a prominent role in how this technology is going to be used. And simply we're just going to uh, make some of the mundane tasks in agriculture easier for people to use. So our platform uh, that uh, we commercialize right now is one of the many uh, technologies that we built. And this one in particular is called OCO, which is a combination of uh, you know, sensors and uh, you know, cameras that allow us to provide uh, proper monitoring of the pest diseases and also assessment of the yield and quality of the crop work. So uh, if you want to think about how it works, uh, it's a simple uh, you know, platform that you can mount on existing uh, carts and uh, scissor lifts in the, in the greenhouse. And this is the world first production grade AI in horticulture. I explained it in a second. As you drive with your cart in the greenhouse and it moves inside the rows, it knows exactly its location. So you don't have to worry about punching in all your location. And when it goes towards uh, the end of the row, it automatically collects uh, information about temperature, humidity, CO2, light levels, top and bottom. And uh, the system that uh, is equipped with a GPU analyzes the plants uh, and uh, also capture all the information that people can put by hand and the notes that they put in there. Then the system basically combines all the, the, the data that automatically is collected, plus all the observations of a person and broadcast that uh, as the, you know, the operator comes out of the row. And in five to 10 minutes, you have a full uh, detail of all the things that were found. And you can investigate every square meter of your greenhouse from anywhere in the world. But on top of that, we send reports and details and we give calls to uh, you know, customers to, uh, you know, to discuss what was found and what should they do next. So the system, as I mentioned, uh, is consists of a fully independent location aware supercomputing uh, platform that you can mount on any cart in the greenhouse is uh, it's cart agnostic you can actually use this device uh, uh, with uh, whoever the the user is they can go fast they can go slow it's fairly adaptable to the behavior of the user and it does use gpu this is very important because uh, the success of a lot of this automation and ai solutions especially in farming uh, if, if it's entirely cloud-based, is going to be hindered by connectivity and availability of the internet. If you want to use, uh, you know, for example, R360 camera that produce 8K images, uh, it would be very difficult to broadcast all of those images uh, from the fleet of robots uh, outside the farm. But analyzing that on the device allow you to use the power of edge computing to not only uh, you know, reduce the uh, reliability on the connectivity, but also uh, rapid analytics uh, and alerts. Uh, the LCD that we create uh, is a very simple uh, solution that allow people to capture what they see on the ground. As I said, it does have its location automatically captured and we can provide this uh, you know, platform in any language in a very flexible manner. This alone is very important because we actually calculated that it can uh, you know, make the, the work of uh, scouts and monitoring people uh, up to 20% more efficient because they don't have to spend their time entering the data. So when it comes to IPM or integrated pest management, uh, we have an approach that consists of three steps. First step is basically capturing what people can see with their own eyes 
as they drive the system and as they go and check the plant. They can enter the information, uh, you know, via the LCD or to our app, and they can actually integrate all of the, the pest or disease or issues that they find. And we simply just capture all of these things and provide a very nice visualization where you can filter and where you can actually learn the distribution. On top of that, as the machine actually moves inside the greenhouse, uh, the system analyzes the health of the plant. Now, we are not going to be able to detect a small little mite on the leaves or something that is under the leaf because it's not really uh, you know, visible with the pictures. But we can train the system to detect all the healthy plants and all the healthy leaves and do segmentations to see stems, to see fruits. So if there is discoloration or deformation, we can actually mark and find the problematic areas on the plant. So uh, when you have the manual input next to this automatic uh, detection of anomalies in the canopy of the plant, you can focus the person on the particular area. On top of that, we use macroclimate and epidemiological uh, modeling. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually started the collaboration with UBC Medical uh, School to use exactly the same models that uh, doctors use to predict and project the movement of uh, you know, uh, coronavirus in human populations to uh, predict and project the movement of pests and diseases in the, in the greenhouse. So you combine the manual input for the person with whatever the machine can actually capture and then use the model to incorporate macroclimate into developing the outbreak. So if you want to look at this uh, purple graph in the center of this slide and the gray graph on the side of it, the gray graph is what people actually enter by hand, what they saw. You can see there is a big circle and a small circle. The big circle represent distribution of so many different spots with the spider mite and the, the small circle on the right side is another spot with a spider mite. If we just use this information as a basis for our treatment uh, development, you might actually say that I have to put 10 sachets of biocontrol agents on the left and one sachet on the right. But because we use this epidemiological models, because we use this image-based analytics, we know that the left side uh, is colder than the right side in this particular greenhouse. And because of the persistence presence of the cold and dry spots, the rate of uh, you know, development of this particular pest on the right side is going to be faster. So on the purple uh, you know, graph that you see, we take what the person sees today and we use the biology, we use the input from the images, we use the climate and we project and predict how bad it's going to get two weeks in advance. And this is very important. Because if you want to use your treatment based on what you find in the past, uh, you basically are always late. But if you build your treatment plan based on what you can find in future, you can be more uh, you know, realistic. So in this case, the person have to put 10 sachets on the left and 10 sachets on the right. But if you just rely on the human observation, you might actually deliver the wrong treatment. And this is why we actually have also a very sophisticated way to capture the treatment and find exactly how we need to optimize that. We had a customer in, Fr in France with uh, russet mite that they used to put uh, five euro per square meter of Swarovski, the biological control agent, per meter to control uh, you know, their, 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 their pest. And what we find out uh, with this AI and this prescriptive treatment plan that they could get exactly the same level of control with 3.5 euro per square meter of treatment delivery. That alone in that uh, parcel of the greenhouse that they used saved them 35,000 euros. And now they came back and bought more machine. So this is a very uh, important matter to be able to capture not only what's happening, but what's gonna happen in future and what would be the best course of action. And of course, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with BioBest, BioBest is one of the largest biocontrol producers in the world. And uh, they recently invested significant amount in us and we're providing uh, this AI prescriptive treatment plan together so we can really fine tune the best course of action based on what's happening. But in, top, uh, uh, in addition to the pest management, we also do crop registration because you want to know, for example, how dense your crop is or how many flowers do you have or you know, what's the situation with the vegetative uh, versus generative. Uh, because that actually can change the way that you look at your crop. 
Also, we do maintenance uh, you know, work and automatically find issues in the infrastructure of the greenhouse that needs to be reported and captured. But probably the most important factor is the labor assessment and the labor quality check. Uh, and this is uh, quite an important matter that you need to automate because uh, when you have lots of people working uh, you know, in the greenhouse with several tasks, sometimes you pay them by the hours, but sometimes you go and check the quality of the work that they've done. So if they do really a fast job, but they uh, you know, make a lot of damages to the crop, uh, you should uh, you know, um, have a conversation and re-educate them. And uh, you know, this is something that is right now done by a person. And it can be uh, tricky because um, I might become uh, friendly with one worker and unfriendly with another, and I give different marks. So we created this AI-based uh, vision system that, for example, can go and check all the crops and find broken heads. Now, broken head in tomato greenhouse is very important because when they lower the plants, if they don't pay attention when they're twisting and break the head, you essentially lose production for two, three weeks and you have to reshoot. So not only you have to pay more to persons who are not doing a great job, but you also lose production as a result. So this is another thing that we do. Uh, here's an example of how it's done. From every square meter of the greenhouse, we can actually provide this 368K view of the greenhouse. And this is fairly important uh, because, uh, you know, right around the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of the greenhouse uh, growers who had uh, operations in the United States could not actually go to see their own site. And this was quite uh, cumbersome uh, because uh, the borders were closed. And we really don't know how uh, things can happen again. But with this system, you can essentially see everything. And if you find a problem, you can simply mark it, you can provide evidence, and this also help us to build models that can detect these type of anomalies, these type of defects automatically in future. And that's also good because a lot of the time, people who go and work inside the greenhouse for maintenance or for other facts might actually bring pests and disease and viruses to the greenhouse. So if you can use uh, these images for maintenance work, you can definitely you know, prevent uh, unnecessary exposure. But to make it even more interesting, we created uh, this uh, solution that allow people to virtually walk inside the greenhouse and have this immersive experience where they can zoom in, they can actually go a square meter by a square meter and see what's happening to the crop, investigate, zoom in, have some, some details in the backdrop of all the history of the pests and diseases that happened, all the treatments that was delivered, all the climate matters, all the maintenance, everything that was done in this greenhouse. So you essentially can go and interact with the crop from anywhere in the world as if you're actually inside that greenhouse. And this uh, has become quite a, a hit with the customers right now in Europe uh, who cannot come to Canada and United States uh, as easily because a lot of consultants are actually coming from Europe to Canada to provide the service. And now with this solution, you can practically go from uh, you know, your office to Moscow, to Carretero, and to Livington at the same day. And this is, this is really a game-changing uh, you know, feature. But probably the most important thing about these images and about this data is the ability to uh, go back in time and do root cause analysis. We had evidences where people had whitefly outbreaks and they used incarcia and the incarcia in two posts did not work properly. And we went back and we find a big spike in CO2 level for that particular spot. And it turned out that uh, there was a puncture in the bag that, that pumped the CO2. Now, these are the things that you cannot find if you just note down the thing, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pest, or you just look at one aspect of your operation. Greenhouse is an ecosystem and everything actually, you know, impact uh, everything. Another example that I can provide, uh, which was quite amazing, was a customer who came back and told us that uh, they have issues with their pollination in a section of the greenhouse. We look at the pictures over a uh, you know, few weeks and we notice one of the fans was lowered by about half a meter. Checked with the maintenance, turned out that they were fixing that fan, but they did not put it back at the right height. And this actually changed the amount of uh, humidity on top of the plant, made the head of the plant a little bit hotter and drier, and therefore it had a negative impact on the, uh, you know, the activity of the bumblebees. So little things like this can be found. So ultimately, what we want to do 
is to tie everything back to yield. This is why as part of the service, we also count the fruits as we move forward. There are lots of companies that provide forecasting, long-term forecasting based on the climate, based on the history. And a lot of them actually are getting these things pretty good. The long-term forecast for ADIX is plus minus 5% for most people. But what really is problematic is the short-term forecast. Uh, what's going to happen exactly the week off? And we talked to a lot of customers and the error is about plus minus two, 20%. So what we do instead, we go and we count every fruit in the benchmark rows. And before you harvest, we can actually tell you how much of the harvestable materials you have on the plant based on the color. So if you're expecting to pick up 30 kilograms of tomato, but indeed you have about 26, maybe you can see, uh, arrange to pick uh, four kilograms of the pink and the turning to meet your forecast. And if you end up with 40 kilogram, 10 days before you have to deliver, you can tell your marketing uh, to prepare uh, another site sales. We do that for tomatoes. We do that for uh, you know peppers. Cucumber we also do, but cucumber is a little bit challenging. We are very good with count of the tomatoes and uh, and the peppers. And uh, in the future, we uh, basically are delivering series of products uh, that can provide complete automation uh, to the greenhouse. We do have uh, a fully autonomous self-driving system right now, actively working uh, in one of our greenhouses in uh, in Limington. And we do have also a solution, which is a robotic arm that can go and put the bios on the plant. And uh, essentially, when the issue was found, when the problem was found, we can go with this robot to the exact location and treat the problem. And we do have this next generation of our plant health sensor that we built that essentially can uh, provide a thermal you know, uh, measurement of the plant uh, to find exact temperature of every single component of the plant and also based on the GPU, uh, you know, on the sensor, assess the health of, uh, you know, different components and find if there is a problem in a particular plant. These videos were taken with a fully autonomous driverless uh, robot at pitch black at night. This is where nobody is actually working in the greenhouse. This is where there is absolutely no influence and the machine goes and find the problem. Now, I cannot specifically say that you have white fly here or russet mite there or something, but I can say that this particular spot has a problem that worth looking at. So when you have a big phase with 600 rows, instead of randomly going around and try to look at everything, you can have this autonomous robot to go at night and find 50, 60 spots that you have to go with the person to provide uh, real, uh, you know, uh, detailed uh, analytics. And this is why, I mean, uh, human needs to be there because I can see a lot of claims about the cameras and sensors that can specifically detect things. As someone who's been doing this for 12 years and made a lot of mistakes, I can tell you uh, human make mistakes and machine make mistakes. But if you combine them together, they can actually provide an, a very good overlap to compensate for their own shortcomings. And of course, the proof is in the pudding. I always say that uh, the difference between a project and a product is a lot of people pay uh, to try something, play with something. They ask for government grants uh, to run a project in their greenhouse. But if customers come back and buy more of something that they tried and pay good money, real money, and uh, put it around the, you know, the, the whole facility, that is the transition that is happening between project and a product. And we are right now at the stage that all of this, ladies and gentlemen, that you can see here, and many more uh, have tried our system and came back and bought more for different facilities. Actually, this morning, I just got another order from a customer who uh, tried the, 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 the Oco machine in Sarnia uh, for three months, and now they came back and they want to buy more. Uh, so I think the future uh, of automation is in agriculture is completely collaborative. Uh, there will be autonomous and automatic and AI-based systems, but you need to actually uh, respect uh, the knowledge of the growers, respect the understanding of the consultants. Uh, you should not discount uh, years and years of the know-how. And uh, we can actually provide uh, a tool and a system that can provide better measurements, better efficiency, better visualization, uh, you know, but uh, we are far away from actually replacing a person. And also I think the future is uh, Canadian. 
specifically because culturally we are very respectful uh, and we can uh, essentially provide uh, a much better service and care to the industry. Uh, for our system, uh, we actually provide a rental uh, you know, support. Uh, so we don't sell our machines. You can rent our machines and one machine is good from anywhere from four hectares to 20 hectares coverage. Uh, it's uh, a rental package that is cheaper than your uh, you know, regular labor. And uh, it comes with the maintenance. It comes with, uh, you know, all the software support. But it also comes with one week, uh, one hour of a week uh, consultation, uh, you know, that is included in the package. And if, if somebody doesn't like the, the service and subscription, they can cancel at any time uh, with only three months pay. Uh, this is uh, the new standard of the service that we want to establish in automation uh, in agriculture who uh, is used to buying things as opposed to use them as a service. And uh, that's my take. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sabre. That was some very remarkable information that you provided there and a, and a great uh, presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to just segue right to Brian from Splice Digital to see the information he's going to share with us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sabra, that, that's um, obviously you and I have spoken before. You, you are doing some incredible work. Um, and funny enough, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, among other things, is sort of in the same space, but from a different perspective. So you'll, you'll tell there's a lot going on in the industry when, when two speakers are kind of operating in, in the same space of, of crop health and, and IPM. But uh, so, so Sabra is speaking about a specific case of automation in, in the greenhouse industry. And I want to talk a bit in a more general sense of digital transformation in, uh, in this case, sort of framing it in agriculture, because um, it's taking a very broad approach because there's a lot going on in a greenhouse uh, and in, and in um, every business really that um, can be optimized and improved. And, and, and Sabra did an incredible job on, on one specific area here. So I'm going to talk about the process of digital transformation, how it could apply to any business, and then focus it down on how it applies to, um, to greenhouses. So uh, who the heck am I? Uh, I'm Brian Hendel. I'm the president of Splice Digital here in Windsor. I'm also the co-founder of IPM Scout Tech, which is a sort of a second spin-up company um, that builds a greenhouse uh, crop uh, health management product, and um, uh, born and raised here in Windsor, uh, St. Clair College, University of Windsor educated. I'm a, I'm, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur, started maybe, you know, five businesses in the area, and I'm really a big fan of human-centric technology. So building technology is great. How does it interact with the human um, is, is a huge part of it and often an overlooked uh, part of things. So just to kind of get us started, does anybody remember these, <laughs> these old pneumatic tubes? I remember seeing them at, uh, at uh, Canadian Tire. Um, or how about, how about these, the, the canary in a coal mine? And if, if this you know, picture makes anybody sad, they did actually invent a device to resuscitate canaries. So, um, so you, can all, you can all relax a little bit. But, uh, or, or these, people actually going in, the, in, in um, stock houses and, and picking. Um, manually, we all know that um, that uh, Amazon has done an incredible job, sort of reinventing distribution and reinventing how they do their business through technology. So, what what do these things have in common? Well, at some point, somebody had the the, um, the bravery to say how do we leverage technology to dramatically improve the way we do business, the way we do customer service, inventory management, but taking a hard look at the status quo and seeing what technology can do uh, vastly differently. So um, what, what we do when we normally walk into an organization is we see something like this. We see, we see uh, paper systems all over the place, some that are codified, some that aren't, some getting checked, some aren't. We're seeing paper checklists that people are miss are not filling out and, and not getting executive approvals. We're seeing double entry accounting systems, inventory systems. Uh, we're seeing a lot of processes that are really conveyed purely um, just chatting with, with uh, staff and management and not really properly uh, systematizing. A lot of confusion coming out of various software systems, 
uh, different disparate systems not talking to each other. So a lot of a lot of problems that we see on a regular basis when we walk into whether it's a manufacturing facility, uh, a, a greenhouse facility, they, a lot of them seem to be sharing the same problems. So digital transformation in kind of a high level is looking at taking all these problems or as many as possible and consolidating them down, systematizing, crystallizing process, getting uh, human labor systems in place to be able to make it very clear to the staff, to the resources, what they're supposed to be doing, funneling processes down into workflows so that things are repeatable and, uh, and predictable and reportable. So um, this is the subject here I want to talk about today. And really the goal of all of that, one of them anyways, is to bring peace to all of this, all of this chaos. And when we do our job well, what we what we hear, you know, years afterwards is is there's a certain peace amongst amongst management staff and amongst non-management staff. Everybody knows what they need to do, um, and that's a huge part of operating a, a successful business. So when when we're going into a business and like a like a greenhouse, for instance, and looking at okay, what are the opportunities for digital transformation? We typically keep four major objectives in mind. We want to empower your employees, there's a lot of lost opportunity um, in, in businesses that don't. Is there opportunity to better engage your customers? Can this digital transformation process include the customer and bring them in? Uh, we're working with a company in the States right now where a big chunk of that is actually improving the customer interaction with the business, not just the internal aspect of the business. Obviously, optimize operations is normally the biggest part. Where are the inefficiencies, the duplication of data, um, where are the insights lacking that are, are helping these businesses make uh, better decisions? And if you're a product-based business, often how do we how do we transform uh, the product itself? So, so, so why? Like why why as a business do you do this? Why why even as a farm do you do this? Well, it, it sort of comes back a little bit to the industrial revolution. A lot of the drivers can often be viewed as the same. So competitive advantage, you know, quicker response to data. You're looking at what, what Sabra was mentioning with his product um, and, and similar in our product as well. It's that when you have the data in real time or as close to real time as possible, you can make decisions that could have huge financial consequences. Um, so better decision making with better data. It's no, it's no use to stare at a huge, uh, huge data set, huge Excel sheet, when really what the human brain needs is consolidated information predictable quality can we build systems and processes whether it's traditional automation or more systems and software automation that can produce reliable predictable results obviously efficiency is a, is a huge deal higher yield whether that's uh, greenhouse production of a number of of, of uh, tomatoes or or parts or in our case the efficiency of, of producing more more software initiatives controlling the production process is a huge one how are, are your, um, your staff doing their job? Do they know the process and are they being forced to execute the process in a controlled way or is it a, is it a free for all? So when we roll out um, HR type optimizations, we're trying to lessen the waste in HR. Do people know exactly what the next step in the process is when they finish a step? Durability of that business. Can the business survive the departure of certain key individuals? It's a huge driver for us. Um, and this goes back again to the a project we're working with, um, with a buying, a, a builder's buying group in, in the States. There's one key individual that holds all the cards. Well, that's, that's not a viable business plan. So looking at the operation, whether it's a grower or IPM manager in, in an agricultural facility, how do you uh, extract the key um, business processes and knowledge from those individuals and systematize and codify those. Um, same with repeatable processes. How do we do this the same way multiple times? And sellability. When, when we partner a lot with private equity companies, their job is to buy companies, transform those companies, and sell them. And what they look for specifically are poorly optimized companies because there's a huge amount of, of yield and benefit that can be brought to systematizing in order to increase the multiples of value in order to sell. So they bring us in to do that, and it causes uh, significant gains in the value of that company just by wrapping uh, the systems in place. Obviously, scalability. You can't scale uh, a business that 
you know, isn't codified and, and systematized and, and repeatable and uh, easy exit by the owners, right? So um, if I've done my job building a business that has systems and processes in place, I'm no longer needed as the owner. I can move on to other things. So um, so really the process of how for us is, is a four-step process, and it's really basic. Talk to key stakeholders, understand the challenge, understand the business drivers, what's going on, what's not ideal, and if you had a magic wand, what would you change? Then we go back and we ideate. That is our staff come together and say, okay, we, this is what we've heard. What do we see as options? Um, we quantify those options in terms of effort and, and return. We validate that against um, the owners and the managers of the company to see what makes sense, build a solution. And then an important part of that, which is often overlooked, is the pivot. So release a solution in place to, let's say, an agricultural facility. And don't just drop it in and, and leave. It's watch what's going on. What are people saying? What kind of gains have we have we earned? Can we leverage those gains up even further? So that's a that's a, a very important part of the process. So so let's cue agriculture here specifically a little bit. Um, and I'm going to have some overlap a little bit with uh, with Sabra. So when we look at uh, mostly greenhouses, actually, when we when we uh, when we deal with clients, um, we often see opportunities all over the place, but I sort of divided them into three categories. So, you know, cultivation, we've got fertigation, irrigation, lighting. These are are mostly being being done already with control systems that are on the market. And this is something that's really um, become a necessity of greenhouses in the past, um, uh, say, 10 years. Um, monitoring and prediction is becoming a huge aspect. And like Saber alluded to, not necessarily having to be on the facility to do that. Uh, crop health is is a major, um, often overlooked, even in some of the biggest names you've heard of in greenhouses, sometimes they're, they're very poorly managing their IPM program. So we'll talk specifically about um, how we helped to digitally transform that for, uh, for, for greenhouses as well. And then there's the more traditional automation opportunities that, that you think of, um, picking, and vision systems, these are actually exceptionally difficult to do even with today's technology, but it's being it's being done better and better. Um, you know, we're seeing obviously autopilot and conveyor robots. If you ever toured, um, you know, toured, uh, you know, Muchi, you're seeing uh, you're seeing a lot of robotics moving product around. Um, but you know, autopilot and combines have been have been uh, in place now for for a, a long time, and that also has a big part of quality control as well. So when you're picking, you're also using computer vision and artificial intelligence to be able to sort. Um, uh, you know, an operation, centralization of operations, as Sabra alluded to, the future isn't necessarily growers sitting in their facilities. And a lot of our clients actually have facilities that spanning um, America, North and South America, and also abroad. So how do you take that key staff, consolidate and let them uh, get access to the data without having to go on site. Uh, farming as a service is now a term that's that that's fairly new, and it's alluding to: Can you bring an IPM team parachuted in? Can you bring a growing team parachuted in and um, make it less the actual staff you have uh, on site? Market prediction and and uh, yield prediction. Uh, uh, again, um, Sabra alluded to to yield prediction. We've been involved in an artificial intelligence initiative to try to take all of those factors: lighting, fertigation, uh, irrigation, uh, historical information, and produce yield outputs. And it's not easy. There's so many. It's such a multivariate equation. There's so much. Uh, there's so much going on there. So what do we know? Like, why am I here talking uh, today? Um, so. You know, this is a, this is a a a, um, um, a conference about what's going on uh, in Windsor. We are a a Windsor digital transformation company. We've been doing that for about ten years. Most of our clients actually are not in Windsor. They're uh, in Silicon Valley, and a lot of them are in the United States. We've worked with Atari and Puma and Philips and Microsoft and all kinds of companies. But we're doing more and more work here in the area because we now see opportunity, especially in the greenhouse space. Uh, we're multi-vertical. We do work in agriculture, manufacturing, pharma. So we bring a lot of that uh, multi-vertical experience to cross into different uh, different verticals. So there's there's some value to take lessons learned in one industry and apply those 
those elsewhere. So um, because this is a conference about Windsor, I want to show a, a highlight, um, a product that we've built. And this was a this was a journey of digital transformation that's um, almost a textbook a textbook case. So again, IPM Scout Tech is a, is a company that we've spun up in a software product built here in Windsor that's actually getting uh, global adoption. So we're uh, we're in South Africa, we're in France, we're all over um, North America. So um, it's it's being here. Our little company in, in Windsor is being seen as a as a market leader, even in the Netherlands, which is um, considered some of the best solutions in the world. So just really quickly, let me kind of put you on on our our journey of how uh, something like this comes around. So you know you're you're a, you're a great tomato growing. Uh, facility, um, you you um, you you focus on a specific varietal, but there's certain insects that absolutely love eating tomato plants, and um, that's no good. And when you cause stress to the plant, you obviously reduce yield, and worst case, you can have you can have complete complete crop loss, like we've seen with with pepper weevil uh, in in Leamington not too not too long ago. So big factors here that can impact the business from a from a direct financial sense so what does a greenhouse do to combat that well they have what's called a scouting team and as as uh Sabra alluded to these are individuals that are checking uh the plants specifically looking for um either signs of stress or at actual individual um uh, pests and diseases themselves. So sometimes looking with a magnifying glass at the leaves to try to identify problems. And the tools at their disposal uh, are pesticides and and biological inputs. Um, pesticides used to be the easy way. It was like dropping a nuclear bomb, wiping everything out. And, and it didn't require a whole lot of strategic use. Well, that's now becoming a thing of the past because of health regulations, the push towards organics. Um, there's a there's a, a significant trend to going purely biological. So what you see on the right is is um, is a sachet of essentially good bugs that are there to eat the bad bugs. So those are a lot more expensive and have to be used a lot more strategically. And what these IPM teams are 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 often doing is using, you know, we've seen all kinds of low tech solutions that that are less than ideal. It was one example of a basically a cork board, a pin board of hot spots in the greenhouse. We don't know when those pins have been dropped. Um, convoluted Excel sheets that take a huge amount of human effort to maintain. So this is the problem that we that we see, and and what what greenhouses are are noticing is is it's a manual and slow process. So there's inefficiencies. Um, we're seeing huge data lag, and the problem with data lag is is when there's an issue, you might almost be too late. You almost need to act before the issue becomes becomes significant, which means you need to act quickly and access to the data very fast. So you need a, almost a real time view of what's happening out in the facility. Poor analytics. So these manual solutions are not giving the IPM teams the information that that they need in a timely fashion in, a, in, a, in an executive kind of KPI approach. Hard to quantify results. What's working, what's not working. These facilities are spending hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars on input costs to fight these pests and diseases. How do you know what's working and how do you how do you not? You need to be able to overlay that data on these mitigation strategies to see what's happening. No triggers and alerts. When somebody sees the, the pepper weevil for the first time, are they running to their IPM manager or are they completing their their day and giving that data you know, too late to, to the management staff? So, so when We've seen this. We ask ourselves, well, is there an opportunity here? Can something can something be better? So part of that journey for us really starts with partners. So we started by choosing a number of, of greenhouse partners that can help guide um, what the industry needs. We then um, made a number of other partners in the industry that can help provide guidance and, and, and funding and insight. And of course, educational facilities that can help provide um, research and access to students. So this is a very community, uh, communal effort that's helped us figure out what the market, what the market really needs. So the outcome of this, in our case, similar to to Saber's solution of 
of identifying um, crop health issues. Ours is is still relying on a scouting team, but replacing the manual um, aspects with with the digital uh, a digital solution. So in our case, we built a a tablet based app that actually acts as the data intake element for the scouts out in the field. So as they're making observations uh, of plants, they're able to specify the, the details that they need to be able to communicate what's going on. All of this data is then uh, packaged, is sent up to uh, sent up to the cloud and is accessible by the IPM managers in a, in a dashboard view with the right analytics that they need to be able to make decisions. So in this case, we're looking at the strategies being overlaid on trend lines and then looking at the cost of what those strategies were to see, well, what effect did they have? Did it work or not? So this product is essentially the, the, the culmination of, a, of an investigation, a, a proposal of solution, a, a validation, a pivot and now um, culminating into an actual software product, which which is um, kind of a licensed uh, product that we're going global with right now. So we've been able to, to quantify results, and this is kind of an average of of, of our data set. And uh, and Saber alluded to a, to a few result numbers as well. So in if we were to look at some of our medium to large greenhouse clients. Um, you know, we're looking at maybe about a half a million in reduced crop loss. That's a significant number. That's a per year number. Uh, reduced input spends through better um, strategic application of about $80,000 and a 25% increase in scouting and manager efficiencies. So big deal. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not just like any digital transformation project. You look at where the future is. There's predictive aspects of of you know anticipating problems based on data like like Sabra alluded to hr efficiency how do we get scouts to know exactly where in the greenhouse to go and when to go prescriptive so release this particular um input at this particular time to fight this particular issue and ipm as a service can you push a button drop somebody into your data set who has real-time access to this data and then have them make consultative recommendations and then, and then pull, pull that out. So a lot of opportunity once you have a digital transformation idea executed in place to be able to further that within the, the organization. So um, yeah, so thanks. This again was sort of a high level view of how a greenhouse, uh, an agricultural facility or really any business kind of can go through a journey of, of systematizing a digital transformation. And um, again, we're here in Windsor, so happy to be a part of uh, the discussion today. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Both of these presentations you gave from Ecoation and Splice Digital were extremely informative, and your your reputations certainly hold true as advertised. So we thank you for the information you provided. And I'm just going to ask the event staff: Do we have time for a question for each of our presenters? Um, we're actually out of time. The uh, the next keynote speaker is supposed to begin on this stage shortly. Um, but if you gentlemen would like to share your, your contact information in the chat, um, people can reach out to you with questions that way. Oh, and it looks like uh, someone's already shared that for you. Oh, no, never mind. I thought it was an email, but it's just... <laughs> And yeah, I, I can get the questions to you as well if, if both of you uh, haven't had an opportunity to jot them down. But again, thank you for making availability for being here to speak with us. Uh, we you know, certainly do appreciate it. Uh, Invest Winds Rest 6 and Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers extend our thanks and uh, you know, are uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what comes in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.